Hello and welcome to today's Pina Wisdom Story, where we get to listen in on the wisdom that can only be earned by professional permaculturists with 20 plus years of experience working within the permaculture framework. Pina Wisdom Stories gives us all a chance to hear from Pina diplomates, board members, and other pioneers from the early days of permaculture's development. We seek to make the connection between the elders in our field of study and permaculture enthusiasts everywhere on earth. I'm Jesse, and I'll be hosting today's conversation, which should last about 90 minutes. Please leave comments in the live chat for today's guests, and I can make sure that Jason gets them. And that always makes the conversation flow better and more interesting when people are jumping in. And today we are honored to be able to feature Jason Gerhardt. For 20 years, Jason Gerhardt has professionally practiced and taught permaculture design in diverse environments from the hyper-arid U.S. Southwest to underserved neighborhoods in North St. Louis to a refugee community in Central America. Jason's design portfolio includes academic campus planning, regenerative agriculture site development, organizational strategizing, food justice initiatives, farmer accelerator program development, and extensive work with conservation organizations. Jason has taught thousands of students for Naropa University, University of Colorado, the US EPA, and Oregon State University, among dozens of private and public institutions. A developer of multiple land-based enterprises for ecological community development, he holds a BA in sustainable design from Prescott College, as well as permaculture diplomas in the fields of site design, education, and research from both the Permaculture Institute, Inc. and Permaculture Institute of North America. Jason, welcome. Thanks for having me so much, Jesse. Oh, it's absolutely our pleasure. Where are you coming at us from today? I am in a little village on the Delaware River called Upper Black Eddy. It's in Pennsylvania on the New Jersey border. Okay. And have you lived there long or is that a new place for you? relatively new not quite here two years um we left st louis which was where we were previously for here and now actually in a year or two we'll be heading up to new york okay like city or more like upstate upstate yep okay awesome. definitely cool. not the city uh, uh, definitely not the city definitely no offense city. city livers yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well i'm a city kid but you know maybe we'll get into that actually <laughs> Well, in fact, let's go back there because I always like to hear a little bit about like how you got into permaculture and like backstory in even so far back as like where you were born and raised or maybe maybe that's not the most important thing. But it's like what places sort of like were meaningful to you in your development? And then how did you find permaculture? Maybe you can take us there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I love telling this story. So I was born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, I'm I'm a product of St. Louis as a city kid and I, I was in a lot of trouble as a kid. St. Louis mm. is a rough city. There's, there's a lot going on there that um, historically has led to high poverty, high violence rates, major crime rates. It's, it's just one of the more uh, struggling cities with, with crime and, and that kind of thing in the U S sort of on par with Detroit um, or historically at least. Which, by the way, I, I'm in Michigan, not too far from Detroit. So that's a familiar um, connection there. Yeah. Yeah. Very similar cities, like had a lot of industry. The industry collapsed and employment left and racial discrimination. You know, all of that is just coming together to create what St. Louis is now as a kid. Hey, Jason, let me interrupt you real quick. I think your mic on your headphones is just scratching against your hoodie, maybe just a bit. Yeah, yeah. Is that better? I think so. It was yeah. when you were moving and, okay. and it's not a big deal, but I'd, I'd hate for it to be throughout the whole recording. No, I hear you. I think I'm I'm holding it away from my clothes now. OK, sorry. Um, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> Here's our tech world. This is what we got. Um, That's right. So, yeah, St. Louis was you know, it was a rough place in the early 90s in particular um, when I was growing up and I ran with some tough crews. I got in a lot of trouble. Um, I had friends who were murdered at young ages. Um, mm -hmm. I've had other friends who killed other people and are now in jail for, for their lives um, or most of their lives. And um, that had a huge impact on me as a kid. You know, my first friend was killed when I was 13. And wow. so I, 
I was angry. I was pissed off. You know, I didn't like the world. I didn't like what I saw. I sort of thought it was the city that I was raised in. Like that's what the world was. And after enough trouble, uh, I just sort of woke up a little bit and was like, I'm going to die or I'm going to go to jail. What do I want for my life? Mm. That was really like 18. And I got into Zen Buddhism. Mm. Um, I was I was basically seeking like personal salvation or, or, or redemption, or, you know, those kinds of things at that age. It was just like, I need something to get me into shape and, and guide me in life because my culture wasn't able to do it. And so I dove really deep into Zen Buddhism. I almost became a monk uh, two weeks before my ordination. I decided not to, that I wanted to be engaged in the world. Wow. And not sort of tuck away in a monastery and just sort of work on on me and my myself and within a small community. So had no idea what I was going to do after that. I had heard of the word permaculture. Um, the monastery I was at, we built a lot of gardens. There were fruit trees everywhere. Uh, it was a Vietnamese monastery. And so their culture really shone through in their agricultural practices throughout the grounds. And so I decided permaculture might be an interesting thing. And lo and behold, here I am, you know, 20 years later, that's basically my story of how I got into it. That's what led me into it. Yep. And I was seeking, honestly, I think it's important to say I was seeking something that could help me make the world a, a better place. You know, yeah. at the time, that's sort of how I would have uh, articulated that. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. That's beautiful. We're still having some of that sound issue. What if we can we take off the headphones entirely? I think that would work. How's this? That's OK. It's a little bit of a different sound, but I, I'm not hearing. I, yeah, was I need to be. A, was it like a clicking? Yeah, it's like a clicking kind of when you moved your head. It sounded like it was hitting a button or something. But what about now? Is that better? So far. OK. Move your it head a little just, bit. Yeah, it might have just been the connection. I think that's better. I think we got it. Okay. So great. let's go back, though, man. That's a, such a fascinating story. I so resonate with the being pissed off and just sort of like, I don't know if hating the world is the right attitude, but it was something like that. It was something like, what is this place and why is everything so messed up? And your your um, experience seems even more concentrated than mine. Mine was more the suburban angst version of that. Mm -hmm. um, and the clear vision that I had as a, a kid and a youth that like the world was kind of going to hell in a handbasket. It's like, man, we're going in all the wrong ways. Where's the wisdom? Where's the adults in the room? Where's the, you know, sensibility to any of this? And I also found Buddhism through Alan Watts. And then later, maybe Thich Nhat Khan is in is woven into your story, too, with the Vietnamese Buddhism. Absolutely. He was Thai. Thich Nhat Hanh was my teacher. Okay. Yep. That's amazing. What an amazing teacher. And and that really also shaped my life completely and gave me a much like a breath of fresh air and a new take on mm. who I was and how I was to be in the world. And And I also kind of had a similar, I didn't go as far as you in terms of like, I want to be a monk. Um, but I was like really, really into it. And at some point I also wanted to come out a little bit more into the world and engage more actively into the world. And that's right around when I think I first heard about Bill Mollison through Joel Salatin, maybe. Mm -hmm. And um, when I finally found Bill Mollison, it really changed my life completely. A lot of his writings and teachings just activated me and moved me into the world at large. So tell me a little bit about some of your first like permacultural escapades did you go on to just like read a bunch on your own or did you take a pdc right away did you just start like playing in your own garden i actually initially ended up in a um ecological design course and okay. i would say like my tradition isn't my tradition sort of in permaculture work broadly it isn't just permaculture because i do draw a lot from ecological design so i ended up there very quickly ended up in a PDC. Um, okay. This was at Prescott College. Andrew Millison at the time actually taught at Prescott College. This was like maybe his second course ever. And mm. so he was my original teacher. We're good friends to this day. Um, but that school had 
the course was interesting. It was a block. So it was a little over three weeks. And we basically got in a van and drove to Tucson, visited Brad Lancaster, eco villages, drove all over Arizona and the Southwest, basically in a van touring permaculture sites and meeting, meeting practitioners. Fun. Yeah. Over what, what period of time was that over like a semester length? It was a block. So it was three, it was like 25 days or something like that. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So that was your first real exposure to like seeing permaculture, meeting permaculturists and getting immersed into that world. Yep. Yep. And I was actually kind of critical of it at first. Mm. I sort of felt like it was overly materialistic, like it was missing the spiritual element that that kind of drew me into permaculture was that spiritual element in the sense oh. of I was coming from a spiritual background and, and perspective with Buddhism and having left the monastery. So mm. I was sort of like critical of it, but I've stuck with and, and almost been critical of it for a long time. But I just stick with it because it still has so much value, you know, and yeah. and I've found ways to make to sort of make meaning of it uh, more spiritually significantly, I guess, than than how I encountered permaculture. I think your criticism of it being more materialistic is very valid to this day, um, just given the culture that it came from and the thought forms and worldviews that informed it. But I agree with you. I, I feel the same. I've, I've kept with it and always weave back into permaculture. Even if I go outside of the permaculture purview for my own interests, it mm -hmm. just comes back because it's so, you know, steeped in nature and natural pattern and, you know, the ethics and it just, it, it'll hold, I think. But I do wonder if the spiritual piece is, is sort of a linchpin that is missing within permaculture. And I know Bill Mollison and and everybody who teaches PDCs, like we can't teach the spiritual, we can't teach mysticism. Mm -hmm. And I get that because that can be so misconstrued and then you can get into guru things. And, you know, I, I understand that, but I do wonder, like, do you think there is, first, do you think it's critical to weave back in the spiritual and the sacred into permaculture? And if so, how might we do that with, with still honoring you know, the original intention and sort of the uh, non-denominational aspects of permaculture yeah there's a lot to say there um well for one i don't think it was bill never really wanted it to be a part of permaculture he was uh, he was spirit phobic a little bit um as scott Pittman would describe him and <laughs> and there were there's a lot of people that are in permaculture and have been teaching and they are very spiritual people and have woven in things like dances of universal peace and even just like singing and songs and holding hands in a circle. Like that's too much for some people. Right. And I get all that, you know, it, it's not important. It's not about imposing a spirituality, but I, th I like what you said about the sacred. I certainly think the sacred needs to be brought into permaculture. And I think it is for most for most people who have been practicing it a long time, um, I find a lot of them actually end up getting more spiritual over time. Mm. And so that was certainly true for Scott Pittman. Um, it's, it's a pattern and, and I think that's useful to track. Like I love these wisdom stories because it's sort of tracking the stories of elders that like what has a long journey bit through permaculture look like, you know? Yeah. And a lot of them end up with a little more of a spiritual bent, at least. I think in terms of weaving it into the curriculum or anything, I don't know. I don't really have any specific thoughts there, um, like the PDC curriculum. But I think it's, you know, we say that permaculture has its roots in indigenous cultures and practices and traditional ecological knowledge. And we've certainly borrowed a lot of different techniques and technologies and even ways of thinking from indigenous and traditional people all over the world. And I don't think we can actually keep saying that if we're not also honoring the sacred, because right. those, those practices and traditions did not get developed in a vacuum, like in a material vacuum. It was deeply informed by a connection with spirit and the sacredness of all life, you know? Yep. So how do we reclaim that? I don't know. How do we not reclaim that? How do we bring that in perspective into permaculture? I don't know specifically um, 
how that looks, but it, we are actually working on it through the Permaculture Institute. Uh, we're developing a course called the Permaculture Paradigm mm -hmm. and really sort of trying to focus on the mindset shift that happens in practicing permaculture and tying that a little bit into a experience of sacredness and interconnectedness um, of, of everything. Like that is the paradigm shift. We're actually shifting to see the world in a more interconnected way. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, Bill might have said that he's spirit phobic or whatnot, but just talking to Michael Skeeter Polarski last week, he mentioned, you know, Bill got along really, really well with indigenous people everywhere, it seems. And that, that, that resonates with something about his depth of understanding of the sacredness of the tree and the river and the rock and the land, and that it's not just this material object for us to like, you know, take and leave and man maneuver around it for our material gain, but it's like, it has impacts. And I think the seventh generation thinking is something that we could weave into permaculture. And I know a lot of permaculturists, of course, talk about this and, and weave this in, but um, that's that's critical too, because that that thinks not just about the sacredness of place and material objects, if we want to call them that, like the river, et cetera, but also the sacredness of time and like what we do here unfolds over time for future generations. And we have to be um, sensitized to that and consider that in our designs. So, And that's really yeah, I'm, what I'm, we're designing for, right? Is like, so future generations have, so there are future generations. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. 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 Abundance. So that's cool that the PI is uh, doing that sort of work. And that's one of the things that I've loved about learning about the Permaculture Institute that you work with. And uh, are you the director of or how, what's your label there? I'm, I'm co-director. Um, okay. Natalia Vega, who is Costa Rican, she is my co-director. Okay. Yeah. And we'll get more into PI and talk a little bit about more what you're doing. But I love that you're taking a lot of the roads less traveled that that inform permaculture and i think it seems to me like really good pattern recognition like you're not doing it because you think it's cool you're doing it because it's come up a lot with mm -hmm. the practitioners and the people that you worked with so i love that you're doing that work that's well well put that it's just come up it's a it's emerged mm. yeah those are the best things to contribute in my experience rather than just trying to force function um, so let's, let's go back a little bit and let me know when it's time to jump into slides. Like if it makes more sense here, just say so. And we'll do that. Jason's put together a great little slide presentation of his work so we can see some visuals, but let's talk about Scott Pittman a little bit. I, I unfortunately never met Scott. Uh, my teacher, Larry Santoyo was really close with Scott and mm -hmm. speaks highly of him to this day, of course, but I never got to work with him. Um, so tell me a little bit about your interactions with him, how you first met him and Scott's role in creating the Permaculture Institute, however you want to weave that story, I'd love to hear it. Sure. Yeah. I met Scott in 2005. Um, Andrew Millison actually introduced me and to him in an advanced design course. And Andy kind of like pulled me aside and was like, you should, you should like try to study with Scott. And as I learned more about Scott and what he had done, you know, that he'd been practicing for so long, for one, that he had studied with Bill or studied and taught with Bill Mollison for years, I was like, hey, let me just go to the source of this thing and, and see what I can do. And Scott was pretty receptive. Um, I didn't really connect with Scott fully until I think it was 2011 in a teacher training with him and Larry Santoyo. Mm. And that's when I first met Larry. Uh, we're still good friends to this day. And um, Scott basically invited me to teach with him. He was like, you've got something I want to teach with you. I was like, that's amazing. Great. <laughs> so he put me under his wing in a lot of ways. Um, I had, you know, I'd be remiss to not mention one of my first permaculture mentors in Sandy Cruz, who's passed wow. now. Um, she really she really gave me a lot of opportunity early on. I took a teacher training with her and Becky Elder also. Mm. And Sandy and I taught together for several years in, in Colorado and various places. Um, but Scott, Scott sort of came after Sandy in some ways and for me as a mentor. And he needed help at that point. He was already, he was getting older. 
he traveled the world, taught permaculture on every continent except for Antarctica. Wow. And he needed somebody to kind of like support him at times and teach for him when he was tired. And so it just started out slow like that. And eventually we ended up doing uh, courses, to, you know, several courses together in the U S and Costa Rica and a few other places. Where was he living at the time? And where were you guys, li- were you living at the time? I was in Boulder, Colorado. Um, he was in out just outside Santa Fe. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. And I'll just say too, that I, I was fortunate to work with Sandy Cruz. I took a teacher train in Ann Arbor oh. with her, and Peter Bain in 2014, I think. And uh, that, that was my one and only interaction with her. But I'm glad that you had that connection as well. She's an amazing teacher and really contributed a lot to the field of permaculture. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so you'd already been teaching, it sounds like, p- portions of PDCs and various things on your own and with Sandy and in the po- Colorado world. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And then I ended up teaching. I taught in Arizona and New Mexico too, just sort of popping around and courses. Yep. Yep. And I think that there's something like really critical that he invited you into, you know, like you didn't force your way in. It was an invitation. And I like, I think that's a critical piece to the permaculture teaching lineage is that as we get to be a little bit on the elder side and we've been teaching for years and years now that we start to invite people who seem really keen on it and have something to contribute in to give them the opportunity to sort of like step into that role as time passes. So that's awesome that he did that. And that's awesome that you were there to receive that and pick up that mantle. That's almost how permaculture has been for me in general. Like I didn't, I learned it in college or I formally learned it in college. And after college, I just started farming and I ran a seed company working with some masterful growers and um, never really thought of like permaculture as a career. Mm. And it just sort of emerged where people said, you seem to know a lot about, would you do a consultation with my yard? Never even Mm. dawned on me, frankly, to go around to people's yards and charge them for consultations and that they would find that valuable. Right. So it's always been an invitation, you know, to sort of people asking. And I think that is a good mark of the world sort of let, letting you know what it needs from you in some ways. Yeah, absolutely. So tell me a little bit about your early on that sort of thread. Like how did you make money with permaculture? How did it become part of your career? in terms of like livelihood. And then we'll get into the slideshow where we can really see what you've been up to more professionally. But how did it, those first, like, it sounds like it just started with, hey, you want to consult on my yard? And then where did it go? Did you start a design firm? Were you more on the gardening or farming side or or other? I basically started like a permaculture inspired landscape design company. Okay. As I realized that there was a market for that, you know, I was in a fairly progressive area where people would want native plants and rain gardens and food forests and, you know, all that, the sort of landscape strategies of permaculture. And it was slow. I mean, and I wouldn't say, you know, permaculture is not the best way to make money. Um, (laughs) So it's never been about that. Uh, But I made enough, like it was enough for me between teaching and designing and consulting. And I also really lived simply. And that's, I think, another hallmark of people who are in permaculture for a long time. They're actually like living a voluntary simplicity on some level. The principles and the ethics will probably have you there anyway, yeah. you know, if you're applying them. And I've lived really simple. And so it's been able... I've lived very simple and I've been able to do what I love. Actually, I think that's important. Um, it it doesn't, it's not the best paying work in the world. Uh, but I am at a point, you know, 20 years later that I can charge a really good amount for a design because I feel so confident that the value is there for a farm project or a campus or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. As your skills level up, then you can get those higher prices. But it's ironic kind of in a way because it's like you've gotten so good at living more simply that it's like the money's just this bonus. It's not like, wow, wow, now I'm going to move to a bigger house or something. It's just like, oh, okay. It doesn't really change much of how I'm living anyway, but it's it's nice. <laughs> exactly. Larry says that a lot, you know, about 
you know, Armageddon and just sort of doom and gloom. He's just like, I wouldn't change anything I'm doing. So I'm just living yeah. my life. Yeah. And that's how I feel with, with income and there's lean years and there's bonus years, you know, yep. it ebbs and flows like any cycle. Yeah. And, and permaculture for me has been, it's kind of weird to think of it this way, but it has been so focused in my life in my permaculture expressions through income streams and like resiliency in my income streams, which is funny because I've been very anti-capitalist for part of my angst as the suburban youth ties into that. Like, what is this economic model that just drives this ecological destruction and, you know, psychopaths taking power and all that. And so I've been very like resistant to money in a way, which I don't think is necessarily the best attitude. I think I've changed that in the past five years or so. Um, but it has allowed me, permaculture has really got me to think creatively about how I have resiliency in my income stream. So I've always had multiple jobs and have flowed where, you know, if something withers a bit, I can flow into something else to sort of take up the, the lack in that income requirement. So I've used permaculture a lot in that way. And I am kind of curious about, I think Bill Mollison wrote a PDF or something at some point, maybe you read it like permaculture millionaires or something. Did you ever read that one? I did read that. I can't recall what was in it exactly. Yeah, I don't really either, but it was sort of like saying like you can use permaculture design to like really make a lot of wealth. And then with the ethics would tell you then redistribute that wealth into the systems that created it, thereby growing permaculture maybe a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. um, I was enticed by that idea, but I've never become the millionaire. So. <laughs> Few have. <laughs> I don't think there's a lot of those. Exactly. If you Scott have, would I'm describe, sure. Bill would, you know, he'd go and teach in the West and, and the North and fill up his pockets and money. And then he'd go teach in the South and empty his pockets of money. And so that yeah. was like always his, his ethos. I think that that sort of anti-capitalist angst is maybe baked into permaculture, maybe not so politically as like real anti-capitalist, but, um, yeah, it's, we all, I don't think anybody gets into permaculture because they want to make a bunch of money. And if they right. do, they're probably not in the right place. Yeah, exactly. And if you do have a bunch of money and you're into permaculture, try to bring that, those, those uh, energy forms in terms of money back into the systems that you want to see grow, you know, with money, you can really take projects to a, a another level in terms of time, like speeding up time for implementation and whatnot. And you can really help benefit ecosystems everywhere with a little bit of extra money. So consider that if you're listening and you've got deep pockets. Tell me, have you met uh, Bill Mollison? Did you get a chance to meet him or work with him at all? No, I never met Bill. Nope. Okay. I've, I've been surrounded by people who worked closely with Bill, like Scott and Larry, um, Delvin Sulkinson, um, mm. Joel Glansberg. Bill, was, Bill spent a lot of time in the Southwest initially in uh, North America. And so that's where I learned permaculture. And there's just a ton of Bill students there. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I gather. And wasn't there, what was the magazine that we were talking about at some other conversation? The, that came out? the Permaculture Drylands Journal. Yes. Okay. Can, I, I know that wasn't your endeavor, but you know some of that history. Can you tell us a little bit about how that got started and where it's gone since? Yeah, a bunch of students of Bill start in New Mexico started the Permaculture Drylands Institute, uh, and they started a journal as a part as sort of their newsletter for the institute, and that grew into a magazine. Um, I now have the complete collection, and we're about to digitize it to sort of reshare that with the world. There's a lot of great wisdom in it that, frankly, it feels like we've sort of lost yeah. uh, in permaculture, so we're excited to kind of bring that back. Um that institute is what grew into PI. The Drylands group kind of got a little tired and um, Scott and Bill started, picked that up basically and started that as Permaculture Institute. Okay, that's great. Hey, please come back and let us know when you get those digitized to share because that's a great resource that I think we'd want to know about and help promote or help sort of like draw people to. Absolutely. Well, great. I think now would be a great time if you're in agreement, Jason, to hop onto slides so we can kind of see the work that you've been involved in in a more visual sense. Awesome. Uh, let me get this all set up. 
Yeah. Let's see. I got this. Hmm. Oh, now it's. Oh, I was going to say, now it's not working, huh? <laughs> can you see my screen? Yeah, I can. Yep, that looks good. Cool. Yeah, I put this together. I, I did want to sort of share my. Oh, wait, we'll have to. You'll have to pull up the presentation because I'm seeing like the EV Mux room oh, currently. OK, then I might be on the wrong screen share thing. Let me undo this. Yeah, and no worries. Everybody here is used to, you know, we got some technical stuff, but that's the way of the world. Now I can't do it by entire screen as we did in our little test. Really? Can you yeah. do the other one then? I can by do the... window, but I don't think it's it's not going to show uh, my presentation. It only shows the... Oh, and you can't do tab. Well, tab would be the same thing. So mm -hmm. let's see here. What is that um, presentation on? Is that it's like a, a PDF? Power, it's a PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, maybe I can load it into like Google Drive real quick. Yeah, or email it to yourself, maybe. That's annoying. I'm sorry to hear that. I don't know why. Oh, it's technology. I mean, it doesn't work, really. <laughs> <laughs> we pretend like it works, but... Totally. <laughs> stuff is just a... Yeah, it's not, it's not real. Well, if you're out there in, in the chat, I see a few people are got their eyes on us. Say hi, or if you have any questions for Jason, now would be a good time with a little bit of a technological lull here while we figure out this next step um where are you from and what you thinking about i wonder what would change that let's see entire screen oh now i get the entire screen option okay <laughs> oh yeah okay hey there we go Oh my goodness. Yeah, sorry about that. Looks good though on my end. Here, let me transfer it over. Okay, everybody can see that now, so we're good to go. Great. Um thanks sorry. Oliver for chiming in. He's like, Hi, I'm from Boulder. So another fellow Colorado or at <sighs> nice. least a Colorado connections. Thanks, Oliver. Um yeah, so I put together this little show. Um, one, I just wanted to show some of my work. I also want to narrate a story and sort of insight that I feel like is important for, has been important for my permaculture practice. Um, and feel free, Jesse, to ask questions at any point in this too. Okay, thank you. But I want to start with a project, a really tiny project, actually, that had a sort of outsized impact on my practice of permaculture. And it was, I had a cup, I had a couple in a PDC and they asked me to come over to their uh, suburban home and give them a landscape consultation basically. Mm. And it was a tiny, tiny little spit of land and we're literally looking at it and the property oh, lines right that here. That is tiny. <laughs> so they only had half of this, not even half. They had like oh the worst God. half. Okay. There was some other parts of the yard that we did too, but this was really the more exciting um, part of it. And I walked around with them. We talked about some options. I wasn't really feeling it, honestly. Like my work was moving to bigger scales at this point. Mm. Um, I wasn't doing as much residential. And so I wasn't feeling it. But by the end of it, I, I realized that I like these people. I cared about them. Um, I wanted them to have a beautiful space to interact with nature. You know, they didn't have that. They had like gravel and really bad grass. Um, so I decided to do it. Uh, I hired a couple students from the university I was teaching permaculture at, at the time. We got their daughter involved. So we dug some swales. Oh, the other key pieces. I said, I'll only do this if you get your neighbor to do it too. Nice. So that we, so that we can use this whole space. So they went to the neighbor and said, we want to get this area landscaped. We'll pay for it. Can we do it? Of course, the neighbor was like, you'll pay for it. Do whatever you want. Sold. <laughs> and so we got even more. Really what it was was we got their roof water because their downspout was right here. Right. And we could send their downspout this way and 
the homeowner's downspout the other way and irrigate this whole thing and take it off of city water, which is, that was a goal of mine at the time. Yeah. So we dug it out, um, planted, you know, basically like food forest, right? Kind of classic food forest style plants, trees, fruit trees and shrubs and herbaceous plants and pollinator plants. And a year later, you know, it sort of comes Whoa. to life. That looks great. It's not the most, right? This doesn't, this isn't like a pollinator refuge, you know, this isn't having a huge impact on ecosystem services. It's not like this isn't, this isn't performing miracles. But what I realized was it was performing miracles in the lives of the people who lived with it. And John here in the background was one of my clients. He, he was a voiceover artist. He basically worked in a soundproof vault in his basement um, doing recordings all day. And his health was deteriorated. He had, you know, what I would call nature deficit disorder. Um, he needed something to bring life back to him. And this garden became that. He, he, he was going to be the weeder, he decided. He found that very meditative. Got him outside, breathing fresh air, interacting with the soil. You know, all that stuff actually started to have a profound impact on him. Yeah. I saw how it impacted their daughter. You know, she's building fairy houses and little habitat homes and mm -hmm. catching toads. And, you know, like they had a wild space to interact with, to sort of help rewild themselves um, in their little suburban cul-de-sac. And so it became important for that reason to me. And eventually they invited me over and um, said, we have something we want to talk to you about. And I was like, okay. And they told me they were moving. They're like, we know you love this garden and you, you put a lot of energy into this. And um, we just felt like we deserve to tell you face to face that we're moving. And I was like, wow. oh, I don't care. Um, <laughs> and it was, it, it, it was natural for me to say that because I had realized through that project that it wasn't about the garden. It was about them oh. and them carrying that forward. And that's how culture changes, right? Is that people change and then they influence other people and it gradually grows from there. Mm. And so that's, that's sort of a theme in this show in the sense that I really think permaculture is about people. Yeah. The planet's, fine relatively speaking it's really people that are causing a lot of the problems and so we got to work on ourselves and i think that's actually what permaculture does and is for um, and i've seen it in several projects and this is another one uh, about a year later from that previous project a professor from utah state university a sustainability professor called me up and said hey we're doing a landscape redesign for campus and we really want it to be as ecological as possible and exemplify some permaculture principles and and this kind of thing and would you be able to help us with this i said yeah sure i'll come out so came out and looked at the space saw a ton of opportunity this is just one of the spaces um, we basically ripped up parking lot and put in a little bit of oh, paradise. Wow. Yeah. Um, we did the whole campus. I'm just going to show a little, a little section of it, but we took water off the roofs. Basically we figured, how are we going to irrigate this in a climate that gets nine inches of rain a year? Um, nine inches of precipitation a year, including snow. And the obvious solution there is gather water off of surfaces like rooftops and parking lots. And so we took all the water we could off of roofs and surfaces put it into the soil, designed swales, and diverted the water ever so slowly. These are not on contour, and so that the water moves and stretches along this whole mm. strip all the way down here, and it goes even further. It's like 200 feet. Um, there's water flowing through it after it's been sheep mulched and trees planted. This is seven years later. Wow. And this is 10 years later. Wow. Excellent. So a real success. It doesn't get city water. It, 
it's just totally off rainfall um, and passive mm -hmm. and filled with peaches and cherries and apples and figs and grapes and currants and all kinds of stuff. And there's, there's a community of people that love this garden, love this campus. Um, they actually, it's not the Moab University, Utah State University campus anymore. They built a new campus. Now it is a, it's sort of like a nonprofit hub. So a lot of different community service organizations have offices there. And it's sort of like a nonprofit co-working space of sorts. Mm. Um, but there's a whole community of people that love this to where when it did change hands, a huge stipulation was we're not going to sell this property to anybody who isn't going to maintain these gardens. Wow. And so that was sort of baked into the, the tradition of this campus or this set of buildings and, and landscape. Yeah. And how another reason that another uh, pro this was another project that made me realize permaculture is about people because mm -hmm. how we did this was Roz McCann, who was the professor at the time, she and I co-created this workshop series to invite students and staff and faculty to participate in the design of the landscape. And so 40 people showed up and got to be involved in the design of it. Um, we did another one when we implemented it. So we did a two days back to back of digging all the earthworks, planting trees and shrubs, mulching, doing soil prep and all that stuff. Um, all of that happened with this core community of people. And I was like a mad person running from station to station. I mean, we had the islands in the parking lot that were harvesting water that people were working on. We had several sections of this campus. So I just had to run from six, section to section. And my overall impression of that day was everybody smiling. Mm. And I realized that that's an important function in human society when you gather people together joyfully. And as this campus, as this project grew and grew, and I just kept getting stories from people, I realized that people love this landscape because yeah. they were a part of it and they go back to get peaches and harvest cherries and harvest apples and bring them to the food bank or or whatever like people love this space and that's why it still exists yeah. and not all of my designs still exist right if you're working in an urban suburban context things change so much you know I've had several designs go under the bulldozer just because we need to put a new building here now, you know, yeah. that, that sort of urban development pressure. Yeah. Yeah. This reminds me of uh, the experience of people smiling reminds me of the word conviviality, mm. which is sort of like in great talk about nature deficit disorder. I think we also have conviviality deficit disorder where our, our forebearers and our ancestors kind of no matter how far back we want to trace them, they would work together and whether that be harvesting or planting or tending to the landscape. But there's such joy when you're working with people on projects um, in the land or building that really is like irreplaceable. You can't get it simulated through some type of digital interface or totally. being on the computer. Totally. It's a human to human thing and it, you know, it's all the better or all the more profound when it's human to human with nature as the under uh, sort of like the ground, I guess, for lack of a better word. And I also want to just highlight, did you do a Joni Mitchell reference earlier when you said that you <laughs> took, took out a parking lot and put in yeah. a paradise? Tongue in I cheek like there. Yeah. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. I remember hearing that song as a kid and was like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> me too and, and i also remember thinking as i learned about permaculture oh you can like you can literally build on top of pavement and put in paradise or you can tear it out and put in like a garden like you did so that has always struck me oh no what happened i hit it oh i don't know don't ever hit the button jason i i hit the button <laughs> Here we are. And I was just this weekend, we were working on a blueberry project for somebody and it was a very convivial based experience. He had his family out for um, like his birthday party and there was kids, there was elders and everybody was planting blueberries. And 
same same exact feeling of like permaculture is people more than anything you know the landscape yeah. and we always say that i think in the permaculture world you know more than the landscape stuff it's about the community stuff and the how to how to re-knit community back together is a major function i think of permaculture design can you see this now i can see yours yep oh it went back to the beginning didn't it oh yeah you hit play from start but that's okay there we are um as you can all see i am a tech wizard <laughs> Um, I don't like techno. I don't like this, this digital era. It's not for me. I've realized it's, it's sort of a colonizing force in my life. Yes. Um, like <laughs> I, so all along as I did these projects, um, I was teaching at Naropa university in a permaculture program for six years. And this program was actually handed to me by Marco lamb. Who's a pine of board member. Mm. And he, he got it started and had this greenhouse built. Um, it's like a 22 foot dome, geodesic dome and can't college was in session from like September to April in Colorado. It could snow any one of those months. And so a greenhouse became essential if you were going to teach permaculture. And I took this program over sort of as the greenhouse was just finished and a few plants had been put in. And, um, I, I sort of designed this up with my students with figs and kumquats and pomegranates and citrus and all kinds of stuff, basically to just have a little space to interact with. Um, so students could see a cultivated ecosystem in the winter and taste mm -hmm. unique fruits and smell unique plants and, and all that. The thing about this that I really want to hit home is. I was with these students for, it was the PDC stretched over two semesters. So in the spring, they would take the first half in the fall, they'd complete it. And that meant I got to be with students for a full year, which is really different than like a two week PDC in terms of contact hours, um, both for students with the teacher, but also for the teacher with the students. And what I learned through that extended format was that permaculture really changed how people think. And I watched my students' minds change. And not all of them wanted to be, you know, doing landscape projects or farming or um, any of the kind of more quintessential things you see in permaculture. Some of them just ended up embodying the principles so much as a clay artist or a fiber artist or as uh, outdoor educator, right? They ended up bringing permaculture into what they were interested in, mm. which I thought was really profound and helped me see that permaculture is really about a culture changing phenomenon. And it's not necessarily about generating more consultants and landscape designers and that kind of thing. Yeah. If, if it's, if that's somebody's interest by all means, but there's so many other aspects of permaculture that I started seeing my students actually remind me of, you know, like that last chapter in Mollison's designer's manual basically says, and here's all the other things we need to do with this framework, like yeah. economics and business and legal systems and, and all of it. Right. So yeah. I started realizing that if, everybody was trained to be a permaculture landscape consultant, then we'd never get to that other stuff. And so we better, st I better start talking about permaculture as a culture changing phenomenon, mm -hmm. not, not as regenerative land management, you know, which and is an aspect of it. Yeah, exactly. And so even though that was my passion in it, like actually that really brought me a lot of joy and solace and, um, purpose. Um, it, I just didn't need to impose that on everybody else. And there's so much other, more to permaculture that we have to do to really fulfill its promise, you know? So. Yeah. That, that reminds me that uh, echoes with Larry Santoyo's sort of like decree that always just stuck with me since he first said it in my PDC with him, which was, you know, you don't do permaculture, you use permaculture in what you do. That's and exactly so, right. 
the story that you just told is a great example of that. I use permaculture in my clay. I use permaculture in my teaching. I use permaculture in my legal career. You know, that's that's the more that's the cultural aspect that that you were saying. And I, too, relate to the landscape piece and the regenerative land management that really struck a fire within me that, that was missing and will be with me until the day I die. But that's not for everybody. And it is really about true diversity means true cultural change with all yep. the facets. Yep, exactly. And and we need to work on all of it, right? It's not landscapes that are causing the problem. Right. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, we got to, we have to change ourselves, you know, or deprogram or, yeah. Um, I like to get my students outside to, you know, in a, in a contest. <laughs> Sorry, or, I just read that title. <laughs> yeah, a little tongue in cheek there. Um, I like to give people skills, you know, you may never be do plumbing again, but at least you did it once. And I remember when I've done things once, I remember them and I'm like, oh, I, I have some familiar, I'm not shy about it at least, you know? Yeah. And so I'm familiar with electric and plumbing and grafting and, you know, tree pruning and like, you name it, a, a whole bunch of stuff. I just want to just extend those skills and those experiences to my students too. Yeah. And it just became about them more than the landscapes we were building. Yeah, at the time it was it was cool to take this landscape around this geodesic dome and harvest water and gray water and plant it and eat from it and and all of that. But it was really just like a laboratory. It was like a practice center as as my students worked on developing an ecological form of consciousness kind of thing. Mm. That's sort of how I looked at it anyway. Um, yeah. I know a lot of them did too. It was Naropa University after all. So, yes. <laughs> um, which is a very unique, more uh, kind of liberal artsy, Buddhist inspired university. Yeah. Kind of came out of the 60s and 70s era. Um, as so, I did a lot of work in Colorado and the Southwest and, and, and in fairly affluent settings and with fairly affluent clients. I started to become uncomfortable a little bit um, because I realized I wasn't that authentic to where I had come from in my permaculture practice. And so I sort of chalked up those years as like great spaces for learning and eventually built this drive to go back to St. Louis and, and leave Colorado, leave the university job that I had and transition that program to somebody else and really put the, I wanted to test permaculture. I wanted to really put it to the test in a tough place uh, that I knew to see what it could do, how it would be received, and um, just sort of see what was possible. And so when I moved to St. Louis, I found this neighborhood, Old North St. Louis, that had a, had a very long-term, decades-old, bottom-up restoration group that was comprised of neighbors who really just wanted to make their neighborhood better. Uh, and all of North St. Louis is really has really suffered from racial discrimination, a ton of resultant disinvestment and abandonment and redlining, you know, was was yep. a big part of it. All of that sort of came together to leave a neighborhood that's a lot of blocks look like this. They have, you know, crumbling buildings, vacant lots, in the places of formerly crumbling buildings. And here was this group of people not practicing perma, like not using any labels. And they were doing community gardens. They were doing pollinator habitat and rain gardens. They were fixing up historic buildings. They were getting grants to do that work. They were taking it upon themselves to slow down traffic in the neighborhood, to create art in the neighborhood to engage kids in the schools in the neighborhood in outdoor activity. Mm. And I just thought that was awesome. I was like, they, they might as well be practicing permaculture. Um, so I linked up with this neighbor. I moved into this neighborhood and uh, immediately decided to go to the, this garden um, that I eventually ended up designing and, and building out a little more. Mm. Um, 
they had a garden and farmer's market that the neighbors had started. And, and I just showed up and said, you know, need any help? And they're like, oh, yeah, we could use some weeding. You want to do some weeding? Right? Like first classic kind of <laughs> first volunteer task. Put them to Yeah, weeding. it's like karate kid lessons, you know? It's the first bucket of cold water. Yeah, you just <laughs> yeah. splash a cold water in the face. Let's see if they come back kind of thing. <laughs> Um, I kept coming back. Weeding wasn't going to phase me at all. Over time, they learned that I had a lot of skill and experience with this. And they're like, we kind of don't know what we're doing. Do you want to guide us? And I kind of saw that, you know, they could use the help. And um, so I ended up kind of taking the lead in the garden for a couple of years. Mm. It was a unique space that there were rental plots. There are like 22 rental plots around a biointensive market garden in the middle hmm. and the market garden in the middle was main, managed by volunteers for the pop-up market in the garden and so we just put up a tent in the garden every saturday for six months out of the year and hmm. sell produce uh, for super cheap in the neighborhood there wasn't a grocery store in the neighborhood all there were were corner stores and so it was basically like a food justice, fresh food access kind of, kind of deal. And I was like, Hey, I'm all about that. Let me, let me help get production up so we can distribute even more food. That was basically my, my, my idea. Yeah. And we did that and we ended up generating so much food and because it was all volunteer based, we didn't really need a budget. We didn't need to make money. We also didn't want to give it away at the time. Um, and so we just decided to model after the most successful businesses in North City, which happened to be, unfortunately, dollar stores. It's like General Dollar and Family Dollar, Dollar Tree. They're all over the neighborhoods and people are familiar with that concept. And so we sort of dubbed ourselves the dollar store produce stand. Cool. So a dollar a bunch, a dollar a pound, come get food, um, super cheap. A bunch of carrots, a bunch of kale, a bunch of collard greens a buck, you know, can't really beat that. Mm-hmm. And if somebody didn't have money, we wouldn't turn, turn them away either. So every cent we got back, we just reinvested back into the garden to buy seeds or plants or tools or replace materials that wear out that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And the beautiful thing was that it was being that I was coming out of Boulder, Colorado, like a fairly affluent community. Um, here were neighbors that just got together and worked together for free and didn't ask anything of it because they saw the yield in it. And that struck me as a really profound model. If people have extra time to invest, like reinvest that into your community. And this community was particularly awesome in, in their goals and, and a real challenge. This neighborhood is there are, you know, people that won't go to this neighborhood, literally just yeah. won't go there um, yeah. because it's, it can be desolate at times. Um, right. And to me, it taught me a lot. I felt, I felt like this community can teach me about community development and community building. And yeah. for as much as I gave, I got way more in return. Uh, in terms of what I learned and in the relationships I built and the friendships I have. Um, it's It was a really beautiful, just kind of like reciprocal exchange where no money was exchanged. And, mm. and I love that, you know, as, as that sort of angsty youth didn't like the economic system. Um, I really like finding actual value in free non-monetary exchange yep yeah and and just on that like a couple things come up for me one is like the eight forms of capital you know like you're really flexing and growing various forms of capital it's just that the financial capital piece was absent in this project mostly and and like you just said it was even better for that like it was maybe a more rewarding process and community engagement than had the financial piece been there. And then also, I just want to actually, absolutely, absolutely, you would say, yeah. And then I also am just reflecting on how you entered this 
uh, system here because you came, you could have came in with much more of like, gee, what are these people doing? Aren't they gathering water and doing all the permaculture stuff? Mm. But you didn't. You came in humbly and said, yeah, I'll weed. I just want to be a part of this cool project here in my neighborhood. So it was a very place based. You didn't go out of your way. It was like, this is right here. And, and particularly, I think that's really important. Um, you know, as two white guys, maybe we shouldn't be the ones pontificating upon it, but working in lesser served or underserved or redlined neighborhoods, people of color, biopoc, you know, you don't want to come in with being the holier than now, knowing better than other people with that attitude. That's just going to turn everybody off and reinforce the colonial experience that we're trying to get away from. And so the way that you ended up doing it was sort of like, humbly, you're going to start weeding. And then they started to recognize, oh, actually, Jason knows a lot. Like, maybe we could, like, invite him now to help design this and help to turn it, quote unquote, more permaculture or or make it more productive or whatever the case may be. So I just want people to hear that as like, that's a really good model if you want to work in underserved communities and engage in wherever you're at in place, but you feel a little bit like, well, I don't know how to engage with, you know, I'm a white guy or whatever, and I don't know a bunch of black folks or indigenous folks. The way you did it, I think, is the way in, in a humble way. And then you see where it goes and where it develops and you never know what will result. I love that you saw that because I do actually, I use that story to kind of say the same thing. It's be careful how you show up. Don't come in with a plan, you know, frankly, if you come in with a plan, nobody likes, I can tell you for a fact. I mean, I've been a part of these neighborhoods and communities for a long time and nobody likes that. (laughs) So come in with an open heart and mind and, open hands and be willing to do something that maybe you're not perfectly interested in and build relationships and then see where it goes. That's the way to do it. Yeah. Um, and you'll be well received too. That's the other thing is, you know, yeah, I guess another thing is you don't also have to come in with a whole bunch of lingo and jargon and, you know, a lot of the stuff that, our social justice movements are focusing on is like words. It's just talking like nobody cares, you know, uh, nobody cares what words you use, frankly, unless you're outright offending people Um, just show in it, show up as a human and be yourself and don't try to like put on some uniform and act and like people will recognize another person. You don't have to bend over backwards to be accepted. Um, So there's that yeah. too. And we see a lot of that, like more like activist folks that come in kind of academic activists and really have no idea how to engage in the community. And, and so it partly makes me wonder like, well, what are we teaching? Right. And so mm-hmm. we need people who know how to be in community and, right. and show up like that. Yeah. It was easier for me, though, I will say, because I'm from St. Louis and I have a lot of connections. I have a history yeah. with North St. Louis. Um, I know people in North St. Louis. Um, yep. <laughs> that's actually pretty important. Uh, I guess that's all I'll say about that. Um, yeah. That project, though, was important because there's a lot of stuff like that going on in St. Louis and a lot of urban farming and gardening. And I ended up building relationships with other urban farmers and gardeners um, through that work because we all had mutual respect for each other for what we were doing. And this opportunity emerged to start a bigger sort of collective farm um, through that work. Uh, I was hired as its founding director. It was really dreamed into being uh, by Jabron Jones and myself, who are just two kids from the same city who wanted more for their city. And Jabron was one of those urban farmers and and gardeners and really big picture thinker, um, friend of mine to this day, who we put our minds together and started this idea. Let's start a collective farm. This is looking at it in 2021. Mm. And let's invite a bunch of our friends together and see what we can do together. And we found a landowner, Jabron actually made the connection with the landowner who gave us access to the land. And um, 
gave us a bunch of funding. Uh, this is a fairly philanthropic individual who, mm. who ended up funding a lot of this project, hired staff members, bought a bunch of tools, bought, uh, implemented infrastructure in barns off of a design mm. that I did. And um, we started a bunch of programs. I was hired as the founding director. This was in 2019 and the pandemic hit like within six months. Mm. So we were also in a way right on time because we had a design, we had equipment, we are already moving and suddenly people needed food in our city. And so we, we ended up doing a ton of food relief um, through this organization. It's still happening today. And I'll talk about where that went and sort of how, how that went. But before that, our idea to have it be a collective of sorts of inviting what we ended up calling member growers to have spaces and basically scale up from the vacant lots they were growing in in North City. Tyran here, who started Heru Urban Farming, uh, he was farming a vacant lot across the street from his house. And I was friends with him. Gibran was friends with him. And we were like, Tyran, come on out, grow your business. And he was like, Hell yeah. And so he came out, uh, several other people came out. Um, we had other folks who wanted to farm, but had like the very bare minimum of experience in farming, basically not enough to get a job farming. And right. my ethos is that people who want to farm need to learn to farm farming. And so <laughs> aspiring farmers belong farming, put them in the, put them in the field and make them learn. And yeah. so here's a couple guys who were in that situation, had bare minimum of experience and they got trained up and now they're full fledged farmers. They know how to produce an onion crop, you know, that looks like this. And yeah. that's, that's the way to learn, right? It's, it's almost not even like take a bunch of courses. It's kind of just like, go do it with somebody who knows what they're doing. Yeah. But that's the best way to learn. We also did PDCs at this farm. Um, they got kind of stopped by the pandemic, unfortunately. Um, but I had a great group that a few things emerged from, even though we didn't get to finish that course. Two of the participants uh, featured here, Jake and Nick. I don't have great photos of them, so we're looking at um, their butts. But <laughs> <laughs> these were two, guy, two young guys um, who had gotten interested in urban agriculture. They'd started a garden in the park behind their house. Um, they were lifelong friends. They lived in the neighborhood where this farm was. And they showed up with a bunch of garlic bulbs. And they had found a feral, feral garlic in a weedy lot somewhere and decided they were going to scale it back up and get it to bulk back up in size because feral garlic just divides and the bulbs get really tiny. So they revived it and brought it back to life. And they came to me when they had, they needed more space than they had in their garden. He's like, we got, we need like an eighth of an acre. I said, we got an eighth of an acre. Come on in, be a member <laughs> grower. And so they did, they planted that up that generated enough for an acre. So they planted an acre last year um, that generated enough for two acres this year. And now they have a garlic, a seed garlic business that they grow seed garlic for seed companies around the country and for other farms buying new garlic stock in. Awesome. And so I love the story This is because it's exactly what I thought was possible in St. Louis that like young kids whose only future might've been on the corner, like myself, frankly, if I didn't have the, the fortune and privilege to be able to get out when I did, that I could go there and actually inspire some, some young guys to, to take up a horticultural tradition and start a business and, and be entrepreneurial about it. Um, it turned out that it, it that's a real phenomenon it, and it can actually work. So Jake and Nick are those guys, they found free garlic even, like I, the whole story is just amazing from how they started to where they are now. Um, being a full-fledged garlic seed company. So we gave a lot of access to land to folks like that. And there's several other folks um, that started either produce businesses or herbal medicine businesses or flower, cut flowers. 
and everybody's sharing tools. And mind you, none of this would have been possible without like in turning the this- crop. Oh, I lost you there. I think Jason. Oh, I got you back though. So you might want to go back maybe 30 seconds. You were just finishing up with talking about how they developed that into a two acre seed production, garlic seed production business. Yeah, yeah. So basically those guys are like the model of young people learning horticulture and agriculture and starting a business, you know. And that's part of what this Confluence Farms Collective was about, was kind of like accelerate businesses that they already have a plan, they already are in motion. Let's give them space and mentors, mentorship to accelerate what they're doing so they can actually make it. Um, so none of this would have been possible without the funder buying all the tools, giving us access to the land, giving us a budget and staff members even to help get this all going. Another member of that PDC, Leah Burnett, um, she came up to me in that course, we walked in, there's a bunch of forest on this property and we walked into the forest for some observation exercises in groups and, and alone. And at the end of it, Leah came up to me and was like, I never been in a forest before. And it hit me because I realized, because I had the same realization, but I was so much younger and here she was, you know, fully adult and, well into her life and still had never been in a forest before. And she was so impacted by the forest experience. She said, could I like, maybe I could lead nature walks through the forest here for, for people in my community. I was like, you want to do that? Sure. Like, absolutely go for it. Um, So she started a program called normalizing black women in nature. Uh, So Leah started this program. Um, She was eventually hired as a community engagement manager for the the whole project and did a lot of different programs one of which that we thought up was to do free veggie pop-up markets in the garden or in neighborhoods throughout north city because we had funding we could just give the food away Um, and it was the pandemic and people needed fresh food and these are neighborhoods that don't have access to great quality fresh food and so she popped up in her neighborhood started small just basically putting it out on facebook like hey i'll be at the corner of so and so and so and so from this time got a bunch of free produce come get some and they it's it's taken off to where it's just like a booming thing and it's a great model if you have funding and people growing food that are getting funding from elsewhere to distribute that food for free um, she's now expanded to a couple different neighborhoods. Another big part of where the food went was to the North Sarah Food Hub um, that Jabron Jones started um, from earlier. He had a commercial kitchen space that had big walk-in coolers, walk-in freezers, and grant money to hire staff, hire chefs basically to prepare food and distribute that food as prepared, pre-prepared meals. And so he got contracts with hospitals, schools, public housing projects to deliver prepared meals to families and seniors um, during the pandemic who were on lockdown, basically. So all the food was getting made to go to those programs. I think at this point, like Tens and tens, probably hundreds of thousands of prepared meals have been distributed through this project. Um, and it wow. just grows and grows um, to now there's other cities getting interested um, that we're talking to. So another program that was started that the funder of the project actually thought up was let's not have a community supported agriculture. Let's flip that on its head and have an agriculture that supports community. Mm-hmm. Because we had the money, we could give free produce boxes away. And so Mm -hmm. we went into the neighborhoods and advertised, we're going to have 20 free produce boxes to to 20 families. Uh, This pilot, the first year was in 2021, I think. And those families would have to come to the farm to pick it up. And that was intentional because we wanted people to come to the farm 
and see a very diverse collection of people working together and um, have that experience of what farming looks like with like a new generation of farmers and doing it in a very permacultural high intensive way with rain gardens and edible landscape everywhere. I mean, the place is beautiful. Um, and what ended up happening was a, a, some of those folks ended up connecting with each other and they happened to be all elderly women who were a part of the great migration where they left their agriculture, they left their farms and agricultural roots in the South and migrated to cities in the North. Um, and this was during Jim Crow era and agricultural policy that was pushing people off of small farms mm. and discrimination and all that. Basically we're going to the North and for these ladies, they, they had agricultural roots and they got reconnected with, to their roots through this project. And it touched them so deeply by the end of the season, they wanted to give something back because they'd received this for free. And they, they decided to get together and make face masks for all the staff and farmers at Confluence. Confluence didn't have a logo or a website, like basically still doesn't very much just ground focused, not on social media. It's not about that, but they came up with this tagline that says the healing land. And I thought it was beautiful because they told us what we were doing. The community came and said, this is what you're doing. You're providing healing. You're reconnecting us to nature. You're reconnecting us with our roots. You're showing that black people can farm in uh, a suburban environment and generate livelihoods and mentor youth. And all of that was so beautiful. And they viewed all that work as healing. And I think that the best thing you can get from a community is that they tell you what you're doing for them. Yeah. And that sort of goes back to like, how do you enter a community? You don't enter with a plan and a vision and a mission. Even you enter with open arms and you let the community tell you what they need. And this community has clearly told this farm what its purpose is. Mm. Um, and I left this project in 2000. I left this project about 18 months ago um, and, and moved away from St. Louis because my wife wanted to be near her family, um, especially after the pandemic when we didn't get to see them for like three years. And so, or two years, um, we made the move. The project's going still strong. Jabron Jones is now the director. They're going through a major transition right now. A lot of the staff members there's been like some real disharmony on the project. And so I don't want to sugarcoat this. Like this could seem like the most amazing thing in the world. And some of the experiences are that I had there are truly some of the most memorable moments of my life. And it's all, it's not all rainbows and unicorns though. It's really hard work. And there's some difficulty uh, in the group right now and how they work through it is going to be the real, the real Testament. But what a huge thing I learned through this project is that it's, we really have to work on ourselves. We really have to know how to connect with each other and how to be honest and how to be humble and how to not seek our own fame mm -hmm. and, and work together. And that's because I believe this work is really all about connection and mutualism to each other in the land. I think the essence of permaculture is developing an ecological culture. And for a lot of us, we've been so divorced from the land, from traditions, from core value, community values, you know, core values as, as community members, you know, um, dependent on each other and accountable to each other. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of work that permaculture that will have to happen through permaculture projects or within permaculture projects focusing on that because it almost seems like every time you get a group together to do something long term it doesn't last it falls apart yeah and that's because we don't know how to work together we, we we are of a cultural mindset of individuality and 
and be careful of things that send you more into your individuality. I would say embrace things that send you into community and loving arms with, with others. And, and we need to work being that permaculture is about people. We need to let it work on us so that we develop further so that we can do things together that lasts. And otherwise, it's just a little blip on the radar. And frankly, for communities in need, they're tired of that. There's been so many efforts that come and go, that get started, fizzle out, be the difference, you know, like be the ones who can make it work. If you have funding and it's secure funding, move to the next stage. That's securing your relationships with everybody so that you can continue the work. So how are you connecting? That's like my big sort of koan at the end of this is that I want everybody to take home and, and think about how are you connecting in your community, in your local community? You know, permaculture, we can get lost on the screen. We can get lost in social media. We can get lost promoting our business. Mm. Ultimately, it's about developing communal structures that help us get free of the mainstream. It's not about carving out a niche within the mainstream. It's about pulling the mainstream out of the current onto the edge, you know? So I want people in permaculture, this is like my challenge right now is how are you connecting? You know, mm. it's not all about your business. It's not all about your bottom line. It's not all about a triple bottom line, even like do the first things that aren't profit first. And then then try to make some money, you know, like, I just want to see more community action with permaculture. And I think it's there. It, I think that's actually what permaculture is, but the online presence of it, it just doesn't look like that. And so like, I want to get off digital spaces, frankly, cause it's, it's skewing what I think permaculture is actually all about. It's not about a livelihood. It's about building structures that help us get free. And that starts with ourselves, right? So decolonize your consciousness, right? In your own life. And then you maybe can help somebody else do the same thing. Um, that's sort of like, that's my message. So I don't know if we're still connected. I might be freewheeling here without Jesse. Jesse's gone. Um, maybe I'll pop into the YouTube and see if... I can... Hey, I'm back. <laughs> oh, you're back. Great. Hey. <laughs> hey, man. And that, that was such a great uh, last sort of um, statement that you were making. I'm sad that I missed it, but I think the audience got it, which is the most important thing. Great. Um, so thank, <laughs> thank you, Jason, for sharing that. And uh, thank you so much for honing in on that people piece to the permaculture puzzle and really sort of reminding us all what it really is all about. Um, and I think, you know, I've worked in mental health prior to and in in mixed in with my permaculture study and that you know it does seem to be where the rubber meets the road is how we engage in conflict how we engage in difference how we and that's really what community is about it's it's warm and fuzzy a lot of times because you know you feel connected and you do great projects but there's the real thing of like people getting triggered by each other or people having dif disagreements about worldview or the way you talk to somebody or you know, perceived or real uh, injustices or mismanaging the human relationship. And somehow we have to work through those um, in our culture, kind of like what you were saying, and you may have already touched on this and I just faded out of my technology here, but it seems like we live in a culture where we tend to run from that. We just say, well, I'll just cancel this person or I'll quit this community garden and I'll go to the next one or whatever. <laughs> and that's, you know, Echoing along what you're saying, I would just encourage people to work through those hard conversations, keep that open mind enough to really hear somebody where they're coming from, even if you don't agree with them, and then seek to incorporate what they've said into your understanding of the tapestry of the community. Again, even if you don't fully agree, take it into consideration because that's, that's their experience, you know, and, and this ties all the way back into the Buddhist sort of conversation and like what Thich Nhat Hanh teaches, which is compassion on being able to like really, really, truly imbibe in what somebody else's experience is, even if it's discoherent with your own. Um, yeah. And that's the, I think that's maybe the final piece that and 
being able to be rooted in, in place. That's the other thing our culture is not great at is like, I'm a transplant. I live in Ypsilanti, but I grew up in Lapeer, you know, so I'm still, I'm, I'm a Michigan guy, but I, I haven't maintained that rootedness to place where my grandparents also had that same, you know, root and their grandparents before them. So those are, I think those are the two big issues in our in our way of developing that ecological culture is the mm-hmm. rootedness of place and then the ability to like truly disagree with each other and then grow into that and grow deeper into our community. I'm so glad you mentioned the rootedness in place, which is something I've not done well, you know, honestly. I've moved around a lot and that's just been life circumstances or opportunities or um desire to to go back to where I'm from and my wife's desire to be near her family right and so uh, a part of the the part of that issues at confluence are that you know I left that project relatively early and I was a leader on it and people really looked to me as that and I got a call yesterday somebody just said I I wish you were still here and as if I was going to prevent all that from happening. Maybe so, maybe not. But I just think it's a failing a little bit on my end for having left. And and I can own that. I can realize that that was a disruption on the project at a point that it didn't need a disruption. Yeah. And so, you know, I can own that too. And I think that's really important. Try to figure out where you want to be. I think Mark Krawcheck actually said this in his interview with you like try to figure out where you want to be relatively soon so you can get started and even you know even if that's just so you can plant trees and harvest sooner you know yeah 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 well beautiful we have a couple comments here i don't know if you can see these if they pop up for you jason or not but i can see that one you can yeah okay cool thank you Raphael, for saying that and i agree and and our friend matt who I work with and with Pina. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate that. Hey, Matt. Matt's been, yeah, you get, I know Matt, you get, I've gotten yeah. to meet him. Yeah. I really like yeah. him. We're, we're going to get out on some river adventures and that sounds really enjoyable to me. Well, let's, <laughs> let's wind down here, but I think in a previous conversation, didn't we talk a little bit about Bill Mollison stories Did, or, or was it Scott Pittman stories that you were like, Hey, remind me, I have some interesting stories that I might share. <laughs> yeah, I guess um, I don't have Bill Mollison stories because I didn't know Bill, but I knew Bill through Scott, I feel like. And yeah, um, I think it's Scott and Bill went all over the world and really they kind of like brought permaculture all around the world early, early on. Scott was one of the first people to travel with Bill and teach and brought it to places all over the place and taught in like really rough can, you know, teaching under like a veranda that's leak that doesn't protect you from the rain, just protects you from the sun. And these (laughs) courses were three weeks long at the time, you know? Yeah. So like people would, they, their courses had 50, 60 people, like a hundred, some courses had a hundred people. Wow. They were rocking big courses and bringing permaculture to cultures all over all over the place and we're fairly well received and they're they that scott was full of stories but one that always stands out to me is he taught with bill in the ecuadorian amazon in a course to several indigenous groups and some westerners were also um welcome to that course and Scott said these two warriors from a village showed up every day and sat right in the front, like full paint, like painted faces and spears, like traditional dress and everything and sat right up front. Didn't speak a word of, of English. Um, the course was being translated into Spanish. They didn't speak a word of Spanish. Wow. And yet they showed up every single day and Scott, Scott was like, what do you think that was about? I was, I don't know. I wasn't there. Um, He said, Bill thought it was because we had chicken for lunch every day. (laughs) They just want, everybody loves chicken. Scott was like, Bill's such a, such a spiritual phobe that um, 
Scott thought that they really felt something that they were like, oh, this is this is of a sort of kin form of wisdom to our culture. And they just they were like in, in awe of it or sort of like in flabbergasted that they were seeing that from two white guys. And Scott. Scott was able to see that way that like, yeah, we're doing something deeper with like, there's, there's an energy field that gets created almost in a PDC. Mm -hmm. I think the students feel it. I know I felt it as a teacher and a student. And we're talking about an old form of, of being and knowledge and, and it resonates with people all over the world. And that's really the beauty of it. Despite, you know, the amount of criticism that can come permaculture's way it's all over the world. It's being practiced all over the world and people have found value in it. And that's undeniable. And so, you know, whatever one's views are like permaculture has been an incredible success. It's 50 year mark basically, right? Like we're kind of at that 50 year mark and, and it's a good time to take stock of what this is and what we're, what we're doing with it. You know, I think, I think it really is about changing our paradigms and our culture and not in a momentary sense, but to where it becomes to where ecological decision-making becomes our natural reaction. You know, yeah. that's, I think that's what we're trying to achieve. I think that's what we need to achieve. Yeah. Yeah. I, I tend to think nowadays that, uh, that permaculture is a bit of a bridge to that old sacredness sort of way that we used to all have in our indigenous traditions and, and rootedness in place and stewardship of land and culture. And it's like, we need a bridge because we've lost that so profoundly. Um, so, th- you know, we were talking, we had a small permaculture gathering just a couple days ago, and we were sort of talking about how d- you don't have to be sanctimonious about it, nor do you have to flagellate yourself because you're not fully ecologically there yet or something. It's a long transition bridging a a mindset, a worldview to another worldview. And it comes in spurts and stops and it comes through practice of time spent doing this sort of thinking. And we may never even get there in our full life. Maybe that's not our path, really. The path is bringing the next generation or Mm those seeds in the gardens in St. Louis, you know, the human seeds and the idea seeds. And we don't know how it'll all unfold, but I, I agree with you that permaculture has been a wild success insofar as it's everywhere on earth. There's people like you and me doing it. I might, we might've lost you, Jesse. Um, since probably the listeners can still hear me, I'll share another along these lines. Um, sorry to miss what Jesse's saying, but I'll share a, a line from Scott Pittman that really I think was one of his most profound. And this came about <clears throat> him and I were sitting on a veranda in Costa Rica and we were teaching a course in a refugee camp uh, in the southern jungle and it I was sort of, I felt a little out of place, to be honest. Like, I'm not the sort of globetrotter who goes to the global south and puts on courses and stuff. Um, that's at least not been how I've I've moved in permaculture. And it, I felt a little, Jesse, I just went into a story. Good. Keep you going. Cut, you cut out. All right, great. I felt a little out of place at this course in, in, Central America. And I just, I said to Scott, what the hell are we doing here? And Scott kept looking forward the entire time. We were just like sitting side by side overlooking a little garden. And he said, we're empowering people to think in the ways that they always wanted to, but we're always taught not to. Wow. And that hit me. And I've had to get a lot more specific on what that means i actually have to credit brad lancaster a friend of mine who is a great conversation partner he's really challenged me to get specific what do you you can't just say different you have to mean different what different Mm -hmm. how and scott sort of elucidated this further but with a question 
that ended up being more koan-like than anything. And he said, what does paradise look like to the Inuit? Hmm. And when I think of the Inuit, I think of a polar landscape and their, you know, seafaring and hunters and gatherers, non-agricultural people. And most of the landscape is frozen, right? Most of the year. And I think Scott really was trying to point out what is paradise to the culture of the Inuit? It's not a food forest, right? It's not a biointensive market garden. It's not an herb spiral. It's a worldview. It's a mindset, you know? And so that really hit me, hit home for me. Like, what am I doing as a, as a permaculture teacher? It's been a bewildering journey, frankly. Um, mm -hmm. But that hit it home for me was, it's about mindsets. It's about changing the way people think, and that will change how they are and what they do. Dude, what's that quote again? Say it one more time. That's such a good quote. What does paradise look like to the Inuit? Oh, no, sorry, not that one. Uh, the one that was like, we're teaching people something about how they always wanted to think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we're empowering people to think in the ways they always want to, wanted to, but we're always taught not to. Mm, that really hits. That hits hard for me. Yeah. And, and that is a great Cohen, too, because I've never thought about paradise for an Inuit, but it certainly wouldn't be what I think of in the temperate climate that I'm in. So, right. Those are beautiful, Jason. I wish I wasn't having internet issues and I'd keep, we could keep going a little bit longer, but I, I, I think just because of the technical issues, maybe let's close it down here no and worries. then we'll, we'll have to do a part two for sure. Especially as things develop with like the dry lands, like digitization and whatever else that permaculture Institute has coming up, please let us know and we can connect and support each other. I think you know, Pina and the Permaculture Institute are share similar spaces, but like in any ecosystem, we occupy slightly different niches and we can support each other, you know, advancing this movement and, and helping people take their next step along that bridge to that ecological culture that we're aiming towards. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Jason, so much for being here and sharing and, and really for the work that you've done for these years. I really, really appreciate it. I really appreciate your, your presence and your heart and everything that you've been bringing to your work, but also to this conversation. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks to all the listeners too, for sticking with us. Yeah, I appreciate it. And then would you send anybody to any other websites other than uh, permaculture.org or um, any? My design, that you my, design share company, that my design company is realearthdesign.com. Um, okay. I'm pretty busy to be honest. So, you know, if you want to hire me, maybe that's going to take a while. <laughs> I don't yeah. really, I don't need to market myself. So it just the projects happen. So that's great. Great place to be, right? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Well, thank you everybody for being here. Great comments throughout. I appreciate you all. And Jason, we'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks so much, Jesse. Thanks everybody.